And long-time viewers would know I'd never even heard of self-harm before we became the first TV show to talk about it back in 2001, when statistically we knew 3% of women and 2% of men were said to do it. This would be self-harm, uh, often to mask or distract from unbearable psychological pain. So uh, there's a lot to talk about. And I'm joined uh, by uh, two women in the studio. Uh, we have Emily, who's self-harmed, and also Ruth Ayres from Self Harm UK. Um, I'd like to start with you first, Emily, if we can. Um, if we can go through some of the basics. On why did you start self-harming? Um, it was a combination of things for me, really. So um, when I started, I was around 13 years old, and I think most people would probably agree that being a teenager is pretty difficult regardless of what's going on for you kind of at home or at school. Um, I had a lot of issues at school. I was bullied. I was really, really lonely. Um, and along with that, I also dealt with quite a lot of chaos in my home life. Right. Um, I lost my father at the age of eight. And as a result of that, my, my home life was just really, really difficult. Um, and it sort of came out of a feeling of isolation, really. Um, and that seems to be like quite a common thing, kind of across the board for young people. That just, self -harm. To, just let me get a sort of timeline on it, because there does seem a lot has changed in the last seventeen years. How yeah. long ago are we talking about when you? So started? I started self harming about eleven years ago when really? I was about so, thirteen. So I'm twenty four now. Early noughties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any questions? Um, well, you you just explained just, just the background as to why you started to self harm, but do. You, do you think yourself that it can be infectious, that sort of being aware of other people doing it sort of, for want of a better word, encourages people who are possibly thinking about self-harm? Um, think... I think that can be an element of it, yeah. yeah. Um, I think, for me, it sort of um, came from kind of older friends who were doing it, and um, there was also quite a big online culture around it as well. Mm. But for a lot of people as well, that, that isn't a part of it. It's not sort of related to one subculture. You know, a lot of people have this idea that, you know, if you're like, if you're a bit goth or you're a bit emo or something, that that, that will be a, a sort of factor in it. But actually, um, it's, it spans across, you know, different ethnic groups and backgrounds and stuff like that. So um, I, think, I think there is an element of it being an, an infectious problem as such, but um, there are lots of factors to consider, really. OK, Steve? Uh, how did you stop? And um, I mean, was it a, a self-realization, and or was it through counselling? Or um, again, it was, it was a number of factors really. Um, I began uh, seeing a uh, being involved with a peer support group um, at a charity called the Wish Centre in uh, Northwest London, um, and that group was sort of young girls between the ages of 13 to 19 um, who were also dealing with self-harm and various other issues. That was a big factor for me to greatly reduce um, my self-harming because I went from, when I started in that group, it was two or three times a day sometimes, um, to being much less frequent. But it, it, made, it kept being a coping mechanism for me kind of throughout my life as I dealt with other difficulties. Um, but for me, it was sort of, it sounds a bit cheesy, but it, it, when you get to a place where you realise that you actually value yourself too highly to calm yourself anymore when you're dealing with difficult emotions, that was a very big factor for me. Um, and I've been abstinent for almost three years now. So um, that, was, that was a part of it, but also counselling therapy are very important as well. Can I bring in Ruth Ayres here from Self Harm UK as well? Is Emily's story fairly typical? Yeah, I, I, it, it definitely rings true for the things that we get posting, uh, posted by young people on our website, for sure. I think as well, we are living in an anxiety epidemic with young people. We, you know, anxiety is the, is, the, is the highest it's ever been. And I think when we talk about things like self-harm being infectious, I think what that language can do is stop people coming forward to get the help that they need, because they'll perhaps be seen as they're doing it because their older friend's doing it or they're attention-seeking. You know, what we need to start to do is to say it's OK to talk about it, like shows right. like this. For sure. And we, need, and we need to allow young people to know that um, some people might start self-harming because they hear someone talking about it, but if they continue, like Emily's identified, it's probably going to be because of a deep-rooted emotional issue. It's unlikely that somebody will start self-harming because it's trendy and continue. They'll probably do it and go, oh, that really scared me, I'm never doing that again. But it's those young people who try it and continue it that we have to give the help and the support and the therapeutic intervention that they need. Okay. And, and... So what advice would you give to, to, parents, to parents, you know, if, if they they think their child is self-harming or, like, what kind of advice would you give? I think, um, 
There's lots and lots of debate at the moment about whether it's helpful just to tell young people to stop harming. And I know that sounds like quite bizarre advice to give, but actually, unless we deal with the emotional root cause of what's happening, they may stop harming, but their behaviour will be different in other ways. They might become overly sexually promiscuous. They might start drug abuse. Like, until we deal with the root problem as to why that young person is harming, it's unlikely their chaotic behaviour is going to change. So it's probably not helpful to just say stop harming. Um, I think... GPs are great. Uh, they have a wealth of information about local resources, but also don't be frightened to reach out to things like Young Minds have a parental helpline yeah, great, um, great. that are open from kind of 9.30 till 4.30 every day. Uh, reach out to people like that. Places like the NSPCC, our website, Self Harm UK, has um, lots of information for parents on. So, we've got as well as... There's details of that on our, on our Facebook page as, as well. Yeah, as well as, like kind of GPs and stuff like that. There are kind of stuff online that you can go to. Oh, can, I, can I just go back to, to, to the notion of infection? I take your point that it's very unlikely that someone who tries it once is going to continue. Mm. But the, the percentage rises, you know, from 3 and 2% in the year 2000 to a quarter of young women today, an 800% increase. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I am aware of myself that has changed substantially, I take your point about anxiety is high, is actually awareness of self-harm. So uh, that does make me wonder whether, even in doing a show like this, are people who are vulnerable, who are suffering in many ways, uh, 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 as Emily described, are those people that, that themselves not likely to actually start self-harming because of conversations like this? Um, I think there's a couple of things happening there. I think an anxiety... You know, every... every kind of generation has had its own form yeah. of self-harm. Self-harm isn't a new thing. It's it's not new. Whether we drink or smoke is not right. OK, so, I'm with... So I, okay. every young... Every generation has had its own thing. The From 1970s, my generation... we found out yesterday, every other adult was a smoker. Yeah. Right. So, so my generation, it was drugs and alcohol. My parents were saying to me, if you get offered tablets at a party, don't take them. Don't go out and get drunk. Keep yourself safe. This, this, this epidemic in this generation is anxiety, depression and self-harm. And that's what we're dealing with. And I think... Um, you know, what's it like for a 15-year-old to have uh, a, a news feed full of bad news on their social media? Like, whether that's, oh, my mum's just checked into hospital, a bomb's gone off the other side of the world, oh, my dad's had a car crash. Like, how do we... If I got bad news as a teenager, it was with my parents, it was around a table, how do we help young people to manage this ongoing rise in anxiety, this inability to deal with this chemical imbalance that makes us feel anxious? Okay. So I think that's what we're living in, which is why it feels like... It's higher. I have to say, I, I, I'm, I'm not just blowing sweet. I think both you, Ruth, and Emily speak very, very, very clearly about the subject. I'm certainly uh, uh, a learning stuff. Do feel free to comment and give us a thumbs up if you feel inclined. For more clips from the show and exclusive behind the scenes videos, click here. If you're new to the channel, click the subscribe button here to be automatically informed when new videos are available. Links to our other social media platforms can be found in the description. Thanks for watching.